Hey everybody, I wanted to take this moment before the Q&A to talk a little bit about a video of mine that went quasi-viral a few weeks ago. It was how and why classical musicians feel rhythm differently. A lot of classical musicians really did not like this video. A lot of people were very quick to insult my intelligence, my musicality, and my education, which is fine. It's the internet after all. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that maybe commenters got wrong or didn't quite understand. And yes, I did take a very polemical standpoint and it was not necessarily argued to the best of my ability. I kind of was considering taking it down for a while, the video. But now I want to talk a little bit more about some of these topics, like for example, conducting. Now in my video, I show a rather unfair clip, I suppose, of Leonard Bernstein conducting Mahler's Fifth and the orchestra is way behind, and I use that as an argument against classical musicians having a strong sense of an internal pulse, and I, I know that was a little bit of an unfair sort of argument. The fact remains is that a lot of classical orchestras will play way behind where the conductor is. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, the conductor is playing ahead. That's true, and I understand now the utility that the conductor conducting ahead to show what he wants from the orchestra. That's great, but there's other kinds of conducting besides classical orchestral conducting, for example, Broadway conducting, which is where I'm used to because I am playing in pits and playing in cabarets and stuff. And if I'm not exactly with where the conductor is placing his ictus, and usually the conductor, by the way, is the MD, I'm wrong, I'm off. And it's the same thing with say like film scoring conducting and uh, major recording studios for films, because if the orchestra isn't exactly with where the conductor is in terms of trying to get the cue up right with the scene, it doesn't quite work. Never mind the fact that within classical orchestras, there's definitely different styles of conducting, and some conductors prefer you to play exactly with them. Now, conductors prefer slightly different approaches. I, myself, like an orchestra to play exactly on the beat. It's easier for me, and it's ultimately easier for them. Every conductor is somewhat different. Every orchestra relates somewhat differently to different people, and so on and so forth. Beyond this, there are a lot of people under the misconception that 9-8 is always grouped in groupings of three, and perhaps in the common practice in Western music, that's definitely the case most of the time, but there's all sorts of different kinds of music that use groupings of 9-8. The music specifically that I was describing in terms of my anecdote, well, let's actually listen to it. I, as a trained jazz musician, have been deeply trained to hear the placement of the backbeat, that snare from the drum part, as beats two and four. That's kind of our thing, really, is to really internalize the beat and internalize syncopations around two and four. So when we hear that drum groove, we're instinctually hearing two plus two plus two plus two plus one, or four four with kind of like an added eighth note left over. Just so you're clear, let me count it both ways so you can see how unnatural it is to group it in groups of three. Here's the groups of three first. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. And here is grouping it how we were actually feeling it. One and two and three and four and five. One and two and three and four and five. One and two and Three and four and five. At the end of the day, I kind of wanted to make that video trying to explore why classical musicians had a hard time in the jazz, rock, and pop context. Because in my personal experience, they've always had a difficult time with syncopations and also locking in with the drummer. Maybe I didn't answer it 100%. And I certainly don't mean to say that classical musicians can't learn to do that, because of course they're trained musicians, they're going to learn how to adapt to certain situations, they're going to want to if they have a very curious and open mind. Besides, classical musicians have been having to deal with minimalism and post-minimalism and pulsative music for a while now anyway, and the same rhythmic concepts applied to, say, John Adams definitely applied to rock, pop, and jazz. One of the things, though, that I did notice in the comments section, perhaps this was a reaction against my perceived arrogance, was this complete dismissal of a lot of rock, pop, and jazz music as being too easy or too pedestrian or too trite because classical musicians ostensibly have a superior sense of rhythm, tone, and melody. And that, I think, is just a useless sort of notion. This attitude I do want to argue against because for a while I considered taking down that video because I realized it wasn't 100% successful on all fronts. But it does provoke conversation and I think that's the value in the video. Anyway, this is question and answer time number 22. I'm Adam Neely. I'm answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. <laughs>
Actually, I quite like the polytonal Linkin Park clips you played, but then I don't know the original, feeling shame here. Sounded like something Nin might do. Also, doesn't this relate to playing outside in jazz slash fusion? Isn't that the most common usage of polytonality these days? Well, yes, that's definitely one application of polytonality. Jazz musicians will often superimpose a different key against the one that they're playing in to get a very outside modern sound. And it's a very easy and effective way of doing it. It's also called side slipping. So say you want to improvise over an A minor vamp. A good technique is to try and improvise in G sharp minor for a couple beats or potentially a couple bars before resolving it back to A minor. The idea of tension and release is very important when you're trying to do this because it can get way too outside way too quickly if you're not careful, but that is a common application of polytonality. Very well done. As a guitarist that plays bass on my own recordings, how can I improve my technique to eliminate or reduce the amount of extraneous string noise? I get lots of fret noise, string noise, clacks, clicks, even some accidental artificial harmonics from my picking hand, depending on where I position it. So first of all, it is a common annoyance with a lot of people that bass is actually quite a noisy instrument, especially with all that string noise. The things that I would suggest, one, embrace the string noise because very often that's actually what you want. Second, learn how to mute your bass properly. The very first Adam Neely's bass lessons is actually a lesson on muting your bass. Uh, so check that one out. And third, if it bothers you too much, definitely just roll down the treble because honestly, there's no shame in doing that. That was the most intense use of any horned instrument I have ever seen, Lamau. Does it make you <clears throat> horny? You should always use all your left hand fingers when playing a bass. In fact, you should position your left hand such each finger covers a fret. If you cannot do that, your instrument is too big and you need to buy a smaller one. There is no other way around it if you want to be able to improvise along complex chordal changes. So here's the thing, as a guitarist switching to bass, I'm going to assume that you already know how to use all four fingers in your left hand and also that you can improvise over complex chordal changes. But as a guitarist switching to bass, why are you improvising over complex chordal changes using one finger per fret? Are you doing intense soloing on bass? Probably not the reason why you watched that video, how to play bass for guitarists. It was a video coming up with practical tips for guitar players to learn how to embrace the bass guitar as its own instrument and not just a guitar that's larger. I'm a guitarist who has picked up bass as a second instrument. Why is the standard bass scale 34 inches? I see some kits go down to 30 inches. What will I lose with four inch less scale? Thanks. That's a good question. From my understanding, when you have a longer scale length, the string has more room to be subdivided into overtones, so it's a richer sound when you have a longer scale length. But there is more tension, and it can be a little bit harder to play. Now, the short scale instruments actually have a particular sound unto themselves, and I don't think you're losing a whole lot, rather it's just a different sort of sound. They certainly are easier to play, and I definitely don't look down upon anybody who plays a shorter scale instrument, but it is a definite trade-off between the richer, fuller, fundamental. Apologies for what may seem a direct question, and truly, I have nothing but respect. What does your education consist of? Did you go to a university? And if so, what did you study? If not, same so. I'm just wondering how someone comes to possess such an incisive mind. Good question. I went to Berkeley uh, for my undergraduate degree. I also went to the Manhattan School of Music for my graduate degree. Both were degrees in jazz composition. So I am <laughs> overqualified in writing jazz music, and that's about it. <laughs> How is darky racist if it's accurate? Whitey is the same thing. I understand it's not the kindest term, but culture in context. So the reason why I didn't sing Swanee River isn't because it was racist. I mean, yes, it is anachronistically racist, but we can appreciate and understand art based upon the culture in which it was conceived. But the main reason is nobody knows how Swanee River goes. Can you sing Swanee River? Uh, the main reason is I just wanted to use a little bit more culturally relevant thing. Now, Mary Had a Little Lamb maybe isn't the most culturally relevant thing, but at least it is a nursery rhyme that's very common in the United States. So that's the reason. Man, I love those grooves around the five minute mark. Can you recommend me some music like that to check out? So if you like that sort of style of 5'8", you should probably check out Billy Child's album, Lyric. That's where I copped some of those 5'8 licks from. And yeah, you should check it out because he's a really amazing composer. This video has good advice if you plan on playing mainstream radio rock. But if you plan on playing music that actually utilizes the bass and requires technical finesse, then you should ignore everything here. So it's a little bit interesting that you call it mainstream radio rock because honestly, rock and roll hasn't been on the radio for quite some time. But I personally definitely play some fairly complex music and I do definitely do things that I wasn't suggesting to do in that particular video. But remember the video, and I have to emphasize this again in this Q&A, was for people who want to learn how to adopt bass more as its own instrument versus guitar. And if you go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to use like, you know, all sorts of crazy techniques off the get-go, you're not really trying to think about bass as its own instrument, you're just trying to apply all of your guitar techniques on bass. That wasn't the point of the video and the tips that I was suggesting 
were not to that effect. Honest question here, is this the kind of thing you study when pursuing higher education in music? Sort of, but probably not really, because those sorts of things that I was talking about in that particular video were mainly just sort of things that I was thinking about and things that I was exploring on my own. You might sort of approach those sorts of things in like graduate level study and music theory, but definitely not an undergraduate level. If it does interest you though, you should go to music school because you will learn pretty interesting music theory, maybe not that exact music theory that I was talking about, but stuff like chord skills, for example, you'll love. I honestly thought this was gonna be like the thousands of other YouTube videos explaining music theory, but you approached this in an interesting way. I honestly think you could write a college level paper, possibly even a thesis given all the research you have put into this video or your statement. Thoroughly impressed, keep it up, I learned a lot. Thank you for that compliment. Uh, I do like to think that academia would like these videos if they were just written out in script form. I mean, the scripts are like five or six pages long with all the annotations and everything. Um, I do spend a long time writing them, so that would be good validation. And at some point, maybe if I ever decided to go back and get a doctorate, I would go and take one of the subjects of these videos and turn it into a doctorate somehow, maybe, I don't know. But until then, I'm making YouTube videos. I felt pretty sick after eating in that pizza place. Why not stick to clubs that have a backline in that area, like Arlene's, Rockwood, or Mercury Lounge? So yeah, those other clubs are definitely better because they do have a backline, but one of the things that I really enjoyed about the show was the fact that everything was like kind of on the same level and there was packed upstairs and it was kind of more like a party versus like when you're playing at some of those other rock clubs where you're like up on a stage and there's people in the audience, sure, but you're not like with them. So yeah, that was the fun thing about playing pianos upstairs. I do really enjoy playing at Rockwood though. That is awesome. And I play there frequently. Hi Adam, awesome channel, but I have to disagree with some things. First, you're a professional, but the bride isn't. You know what works and what doesn't. Brides usually are super stressed control freaks. And if you hold your ground, you actually relieve their stress by knowing your shit. All the best, Pete. You know, honestly, in my experience, uh, no, really. Cause you know, you can say things like, oh no, we don't really do that. But if they're insistent, there's nothing that we can actually do except say yes, otherwise, it will go downhill very quickly. There's a great anecdote. I love telling the story of um, once there was this bride that uh, after a dance set started throwing a temper tantrum essentially on the middle of the dance floor. Come on, come on, keep playing, come on. And the maitre d' was trying to get everybody settled for dinner and the maitre d' was like, absolutely not. But our contract isn't with the venue, it's with the bride and the groom. So we're like, all right, well, we'll continue the dance set. And we continued the dance set but you know, it's you know, halfway through the reception and then we start playing Dancing Queen. So technically it is a dance song, but man, nobody wants to dance to Dancing Queen except at the very beginning of the night, especially not when they're just ready to sit down to dinner because Dancing Queen's actually kind of a long song and it's a very, very slow tempo. And the bride kind of got the hint after that. So there's a, there's a middle ground that you can definitely think about. <laughs> Subway, hmm, must be hard. But wait, what are those yellow cars called in NYC? What's the name? Ah, taxi. Yeah, I mean, sure, you could do a taxi. Check out how much it costs to get from where I am up in the Bronx down to pianos upstairs. That's $60 both ways, that's $120. That's enough to pay for my monthly MTA card. That's a month of subway rides. Not really a financially viable option, honestly. Maybe if you lived in Manhattan, but honestly, below 125th Street, I don't know of many musicians who are living in Manhattan. Sorry about this, I still seem to be having light issues. Great, I haven't learned these new lights yet. The school I'm at now, Lackham, interestingly enough, counters the argument about memorizing songs. First quarter students here are required to memorize two tunes a week in the styles of rock, pop, roots, and blues in multiple keys along with their performance curriculum. That is really cool. I like that gig simulator mode because honestly, that's something that you know other schools just don't have, at least in terms of practical application in terms of what working musicians actually do. At the same time, it could be tempting to say like, oh, that's a little bit too trade oriented. I wanna learn like the actual theory and all the deep stuff. And where else am I gonna learn it besides at music school? You know, there's a balance, obviously. I think there's definitely a balance um, and you know, certain schools might find it a little bit more than others, but that is really cool. And thank you for sharing that. Hey, I'm a new subscriber and I have a question. Is playing live shows really that important in this day and age? Interesting question because it depends on what your goals are as a musician and artist. You know, if you're an electronic music producer or if you're a recording artist or YouTube artist, I suppose, you could just spend your life just like, hey, I'm gonna keep recording and producing beats and producing more and more refined recordings and that's great. But there's a whole other side to music and that is the per live performance aspect. It's in live performance where I really think your metal is tested, M-E-T-T-L-E because that's where you really understand how in control of the instrument you are. And you know, when you're up in front of people, how in the moment can you stay? There's no like pressing pause and going back and doing another take. Whatever you just played is what you just played and you have to be come to peace with that. 
And this could be also for like electronic music producers who come up with different ways of performing live in terms of like using MPCs or combining with different instruments and all sorts of other things, ways of incorporating live elements in it because it's a really in the moment, I don't want to use the term zen because it's not really that, but it's a really zen sort of thing. I hate that I just used that word. Hey Adam, about the skronk sound, does it have a name and what is it? My apologies if it is really called skronk and I am a massive idiot. So when you tell a saxophone player to skronk, generally they will know what you're talking about. Uh, the technical term for it though is a multiphonic. And if you ever want to explore multiphonics, uh, they're kind of like a way of playing multiple notes at the same time on saxophone. And sometimes those notes can be a little bit dissonant and that's why you get that skronk sort of effect. It's really cool. Definitely check out and um, Google multiphonics if you ever get a chance to. What do you think consists a good drummer, Mr. Adam Neely? So for me, there are three things that I look for. One, good time. You wanna have a really steady pulse as a drummer. It kind of goes as a given, but you know, might as well say it. Two, versatility, the ability to adapt to certain situations and styles and just be in general, go with the flow with the sort of uh, music that they might be playing. And three, confidence. This could take the form of playing, of hitting hard, but mainly the idea is you wanna have a drummer that you feel like knows the direction of a song, like knows where the different sections are coming, is able to set up different sorts of grooves and feelings and be able to really feel like they are feeling the music. Because honestly, I think a drummer is pretty much the most important person in the band. Don't let that inflate your egos too much, drummers, but I think they really control the general feel, flow, and energy of the music, and I think that's very, very important. Now, hitting heart is very important to that, but I've also played with drummers and met drummers and seen drummers that don't actually hit that hard, but still play with a very commanding presence on stage, and I think that's very important in a drummer. I primarily play jazz. The kick drum is very helpful for keeping time and filling out the bass sound, but at least for me personally, the hi-hat is probably my best friend and what I listen to most to lock in with the drummer and set up a groove. Nice video, very interesting. Interesting. That's true, and I didn't really mention that because electric bass doesn't have a huge role in jazz, at least straight ahead jazz, but that's the thing with straight ahead jazz is the relationship of the ride cymbal to the bass is very, very important. Now, when you're talking about the hi-hat in terms of connecting with the backbeat on two and four, that also is important, but for me, whenever I play straight ahead with a good drummer, I'm really listening to the ride cymbal and trying to match the attack of the ride cymbal with my attack to get that really nice sort of feeling of a locked in jazz rhythm section. So Adam, why would anyone want to sound like a bassist? I'm not trying to be facetious, I really wanna know. After all, lots of bassists sound boring because they're trying to sound like bassists. Sure, bass players can sound very boring. Guitar players can sound very boring as well, and keyboard players, and basically any sort of musician could sound boring if they don't know what they're doing and don't have a wide arsenal available to them. And now, the goal of the video isn't to try and provide you with a wide arsenal of harmonic techniques and, and all that stuff, because I'm just sort of assuming you might already have that under your belt. I'm trying to sort of get you in the under mindset of a bass player, because good bass players can bust out very complicated things and very intricate and interesting things. It's just that most of the time, that's not necessarily necessary because those are more of a function of a bass player's ego or an inexperienced bass player's ego than necessarily a function of the music itself. Because if you're really listening and really trying to have a holistic approach to the music that you're making, maybe playing complicated things isn't the most important thing all the time. You certainly want to be able to do that, but at the same time, when you're trying to switch to a different instrument, you're trying to gear yourself to a little bit more of a foundational standpoint, and that's the bass player's role within the band. Low action or high action and why? For me personally, it's, I don't know, I go back and forth a lot of the time. I kind of have a medium-ish action right now because I really don't like fret buzz. Like fret buzz is just, ugh. It just makes me feel like the note is crapping out on me. Like the note has like bottomed out and I can't get anything more out of it. And you know, obviously high action me means that you can't play as fast and it's harder to play the instrument. But you know, if you haven't tried high action, I suggest you try it because there's something a little bit more immediate in terms of how you feel connected to the instrument and the notes that you do play. And I think for bass, that's really awesome. Whenever you're playing these really full fat notes that you really dig into, it is a more physical feeling. And that can be, you know, it can be something that you might like or might dislike, but I suggest you try it anyway. But forget it. Here we go. Changing the light, changing the light. Uh, I really gotta get better lights. Hey Adam, I plan on attending Berkeley once I graduate high school in a year and a half, but my primary concern is that I will fall out of love with music, and I'm afraid that making music my career will make me hate it. Is this a legitimate concern? In addition, how often do you fall into a low point in terms of your passion for music? Is there ever a moment where you just aren't feeling it nearly often as you usually are? Yeah, there definitely have been plateaus in terms of my enthusiasm for the music that I'm making, and also, like, 
the videos that I'm making, all the time I spend here. And I think it really just comes down to knowing yourself and knowing when you should take a break. I know whenever I just take a few days off and just not think about anything, everything comes flooding back in uh, a few days later. It's just making the conscious effort to turn it off, making the conscious effort to feel like it's okay to take a little bit of a time away from music because if you're genuinely interested and genuinely curious in music, the inspiration will come back. This definitely was the case over the past five days for myself because I was getting a little burnt out, took a little bit of time, had Thanksgiving with my family. I'm now back and making videos again. Hurrah. Hey Adam, I remember that reading somewhere that females have slightly better natural intonation than males, possibly due to evolution of paternal instincts over time. Just wanted to add to the convo. This is a subject I probably shouldn't delve too deeply into, but I definitely like the idea that men and women have different strengths when it comes to learning music, and they can bring those strengths and bring different sorts of aspects of music to light when they're approaching music in different ways. So that idea about women having better natural intonation, I've never actually heard that before. It's entirely possible. And it actually does sort of coincide with the idea that women have a better ability to discern different colors. So maybe that ties into it somehow. You know, there's definitely the male tendency to obsess over details, like have a laser-like obsession with certain things. And that can be very useful when you're trying to get together a particular technique or study or whatever. But the female sort of uh, multitasking ability, the ability to take different details and make sense of it all and do it all at the same time can also be very useful within a particular career in music. So I think, I like to think about it as different people have different strengths. And honestly, it really depends on the person and how well you can capitalize on those strengths. Hey Adam, I really enjoy your channel. Thank you for your efforts and the information you're broadcasting. I have a question for you. Do you ever have to negotiate for a bigger part at the mixing console either during gigs or while recording in studio? I feel that bass is quite often pulling the shortest straw in the rock genre, for instance. Not so much in jazz, I realized a while ago when I listen to more rock bands out of a compact formation, drum plus bass plus guitar, for instance, it's possibly because I enjoy listening to the bass player. And in smaller band, the bass player doesn't have to compete so much for mixing console real estate. Any opinion about this? So I'm a little bit ambivalent on this because a lot of the time it comes down to ego. As a bass player, you will naturally want the bass to be louder in the mix. You want to have your space and you want to have that recognition because of the volume of the bass. And maybe not all the time, the bass doesn't need to be that loud. That said, there are a lot of trends in modern rock and metal to mix the bass very low, and this could be for a couple reasons. A lot of it comes down to bass tone production. A lot of bass players haven't really thought through their tone as much as they might necessarily have needed to, but this is all kind of like thrown out the window. If you ever see any of the Adam Nolly get good playthroughs, his tone is absolutely massive, and kind of like, I wonder why his tone wasn't actually mixed higher in the periphery recordings, because that would have been awesome. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword here. In a way, Vaporwave is kind of depressing. We're kind of doing what the Romans did with the material culture of Greece, what Renaissance artists did with Rome. But instead of wallowing in the cultural nostalgia of gods and stone temples and nature and primitive bliss, we're already wallowing in the nostalgia of plastic and glass and metal pieces of trash, the trashy fast food style culture that comes with those pieces of trash, and trashy numb feeling experience that trashy lifestyle often makes us feel. Yikes. I think that's an interesting idea, and I don't think it's necessarily bad that we're doing this, sort of wallowing in self-referential nostalgia, because what the composers and artists of the Renaissance did to the Romans and the Romans did to the Greeks was they looked back and they remembered history in a particular way that might not necessarily have been 100% true. And through that, they created something new and interesting. And I think that's, uh, that's a cool thing to think about when you're talking about vaporwave or any of this sort of like uh, 80s, 90s nostalgia stuff is that it does, it is different. It's not just the 80s or 90s again. It's this weird warped new version. And I think that's cool. I would say that Vaporwave is more inspired by the Houston Chopped and Screwed DJing style. DJ Screw was making Vaporwave in the 90s. So I had never heard of Chopped and Screwed. And yeah, I can definitely hear the similar musical characteristics because it was a lot of these hip hop producers slow down records and chopped them up and like did all these like beat repeat sorts of effects and stuff to these uh, recordings and it sounds I guess a lot like Vaporwave. There's a much different cultural connotation and a different sort of aesthetic associated with it but on a sonic level yeah it's very similar. Anyway guys thank you for watching this has been an especially long version of question and answer time with Adam Neely. The lighting has changed multiple times because I still haven't figured out my lighting setup. God will he ever learn. Anyway, if you like what I do, please comment, like, and subscribe. Um, please definitely check out my Patreon if you haven't already. If you, uh, you can see below, these are my Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much for those of you who have pledged on Patreon. I got all sorts of background, behind the scenes sorts of things. And until next time, peace.